Hey, Nick. Hi. How's it going? Good, thanks. So Nick is going to be talking about how to do snarks from hash functions. So I'm very curious to hear this. Take it away, Nick. Great. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a postdoc at Boston University, and I'm going to be uh, moving to the University of Warwick uh, next year. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, sort of a class of, uh, of snarks, um, which are built from sort of probabilistic proofs, like what Ali talked about. And then the, the cryptographic ingredient is just uh, hash functions, like collision resistant hash functions. Um, so let's sort of go into this a little bit deeper. Uh, so the first ever construction of, of snarks um, was from uh, was built on top of these these PCP objects that that Ali talked about, um, and uh, actually sort of going a little bit even so even earlier back in history, um, there is a oops, sorry there is a succinct. Uh, Interactive argument for NP. So this was sort of the the original. Uh, so it's like a snark, but without the N, right? Um, this was sort of the original succinct argument construction, um, and it has sort of quite a simple structure. Uh, so once you uh, so you have a prover and a verifier, um, the prover is going to invoke the prover of a PCP system. Right, so it generates some PCP. Uh, then it commits to the PCP using uh, the, the collision resistant hash function in a Merkle tree form. So this is sort of a, just a vector commitment. Um, uh, the advantage of, of committing to the PCP like this is that you can open, as, uh, as we all know, Merkle, Merkle trees have, have local openings. So you can open individual positions in the PCP string um, without having to sort of communicate the entire PCP string. Um, so the prover is going to send the root to the verifier. Um, the verifier is going to choose some randomness for the PCP. Um, and then the, ver the prover is going to then compute uh, the, the sort of openings of the, the positions that the verifier just asked for. Right? So you use the PCP randomness to figure out what the query should be to the PCP. And then, uh, then you compute the positions and you send them back. The, the verifier is going to check the openings. Um, and then he will check that the PCP verifier, so the PCP sort of decision predicate, would accept on these PCP answers and the, the choice of randomness that he, that he picked. Um, so th the way that this proof system is working is that, you know, and Ali, as Ali pointed out, like a PCP, like the PCP model is not the same as. Uh, like the snog model, right? So you can't just, it's, it's not secure to just ask the prover for PCP queries. But if you have some way to force the prover to sort of commit to the PCP string before you ask him the queries, then this becomes secure. And so uh, this is the, the what this uh, what this interactive protocol does is it forces the prover to commit to the PCP string using cryptography. Um, so uh, so that's the sort of the, the structure of the scheme. And I want to just like look briefly at, at the, the efficiency parameters. Um, so you start with the PCP parameters, and you can derive sort of very easily from this the efficiency parameters of the scheme. Um, so, uh, so the relevant parameters for PCP is the soundness of a PCP is, is this, uh, you know, uh, is the soundness in the PCP model, right? So for a PCP verifier, the proof length is just the length of the string. The alphabet is the like what is uh, you know, each symbol in the string needs to be needs to be picked from this alphabet, and Q is the number of queries that the verifier is allowed to make. Um, so the soundness is pretty direct. So basically, it's the probability that you that you can break the PCP right by sending a sort of malformed PCP string, um, plus the probability that you can break the collision resistant hash function. Um, so uh, this, this is sort of the, a straightforward uh, uh, analysis. Um, the uh, proving time is very strongly related to PCP proving time. Basically, you, you produce the PCP, and then you just need to do this hashing, right? So sort of the extra cost is just in like hashing the PCP, um, which is roughly linear in the size of the PCP. Um, the verification cost is the cost of verifying uh, of the original PCP verifier. 
uh, plus the cost of checking all of these authentication paths, which for Merkle tree is uh, is like basically you apply that the hash function uh, q times log l times. So you have like q authentication paths, and each one of them is like log l. So you need to um, so the the total cost is like t times q times log l. Um, and finally, the communication uh, is is like the number of queries multiplied by uh, the like the the size of a symbol. Um, Plus the size of all the authentication paths, which is about uh, kappa times log l, where log where kappa is the security parameter. So it's like the size of the output of the hash function. Um, so notice that these uh, for reasonable PCP parameters are small overheads. So the the proving time of the PCP is certainly at least l because it needs to produce this this string of length l. Um, and so the, in 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 practice, sort of the, the this is. Uh, the extra time for hashing is uh, is not very much compared to uh, just producing the PCP string. Um, the verification time, so you can think about Q as being something that is sort of polylogarithmic. Um, and L is polynomial, so log L is, is polylogarithmic. And so this is really like some polylog in the uh, in the input size times um, times uh, the time to, to run the hash function. So really, like the, the main costs here are in producing and verifying the PCP. Um, the communication, if you like take a reasonable PCP, is going to be uh, some polynomial, fixed polynomial in the security parameter, basically. So it's like poly, kappa, and log. Um, OK, so, so this is a succinct argument. Like we, we have built a succinct argument. Um, you know, obviously, we needed to assume a PCP. But once you have that, then actually building this succinct interactive argument is very easy. Um, so then how do we, uh, how do we then obtain uh, a non-interactive argument? Well, it was already sort of pointed out in the chat that there is a general sort of method for going from public coin interactive protocols to non-interactive protocols. Uh, which is called Fiat Shamir. So it's the Fiat Shamir transformation. Um, and what you do is you just take the protocol on the previous slide and you apply the Fiat Shamir transformation. Um, so you, uh, as before, you generate the proof, the, the PCP proof. Now this little box here, we're, we're uh, modeling it as a random oracle. So this is a uniformly random function. Um, and uh, rather than sending the root to the verifier, because this would involve some interaction, what you do is that you use the root, or you pass the root into the random oracle to derive the randomness for the PCP. Um, then the, uh, the, this gives you the, the PCP randomness, so you use that to generate the queries. And then the proof is just the root and then all of the authentication paths. So like it's really the, the same thing as before, um, it's just that rather than sending, rather than receiving the randomness from the verifier, we derived it from the root using the random oracle. Uh, so that's the proof, and then the verifier does exactly the same checks as before, um, along with this additional check that kind of the the uh, the randomness was correctly derived by applying the oracle to the root. Um, so what is the soundness in this in this case? Um, so we still have this uh, sort of cost of breaking the collision resistance hash function. And actually, uh, if your adversary is making t queries to the random oracle, then you can bound this cost with this explicit expression. It's like t squared times uh, 2 to the minus uh, kappa, where kappa is the security parameter. Um, however, we, we do have a, a slightly different expression for the on the PCP side. So before we had just epsilon PCP, right? You could you sort of got an opportunity to attack the PCP once. Uh, here, because the thing is non-interactive, the prover can attack the PCP sort of as many times as he wants. Um, so he can try different PCP strings, and he can basically like try and cause uh, the randomness to be a bad choice of randomness for that PCP. Um, and this corresponds to a factor t blow up in the in the soundness error. Uh, so if you want to obtain the same soundness as in the interactive setting, then you need to actually like improve the soundness of your PCP, which uh, in practice means that the PCP is going to be less efficient. All right. Um, so this was sort of a, a little tour of PCP-based snogs. Let's uh, take a take a step back and think about uh, what the properties are that they have. 
Um, so the sort of the, the first bad property that you might think of is that, you know, all of this stuff is in the random Oracle model and some like very smart cryptographers have proven that random oracles don't exist. So like there are constructions in the random Oracle model that are like not secure with any concrete hash function. Um, thankfully this doesn't really bother us very much because, uh, no practical, like reasonable construction that wasn't designed explicitly to break the random Oracle model, uh, has been broken. Uh, when you like plug in a sufficiently strong hash function, um, you need to be careful that your hash function is sort of, you know, looks like a random oracle. It's very unstructured, um, but otherwise, uh, you know, this seems to be like a, a generally secure way of designing protocols. I should also mention that um, there are results showing that if you want to have snarks at all, then you need to make some kind of funky assumption, um, and uh, random oracles are, are maybe a mild mildly funky assumption. Um, so the other thing about random oracles is that they are, it's a sort of robust model. So let's say that I, you know, someone breaks like SHA or something like that, right? Like if, if someone finds a collision in SHA, uh, that doesn't mean that we have to throw away all snark constructions uh, in the random oracle model. We just need to find a new hash function that, you know, looks more like a random oracle than SHA does, right? So there is sort of this, this uh, this robustness, like it, it's uh, like these are constructions that continue to be secure with some hash function, uh, assuming that some strong enough hash function exists. Um, the other thing that you get is that the, uh, the you know, hash functions are relatively lightweight cryptography. Uh, you don't need to um, you don't need to sort of uh, do a lot of computation on top of the the PCP in order to um, in order to like do the crypto part, uh, like to commit to the PCP is very cheap. Um, they're also automatically public coin because uh, essentially the, the choice of system parameters is just the, the choice of hash function, um, which in practice we don't even like choose. We just like fix it to be some like public well-known hash function. Um, and uh, these, these snogs are actually post-quantum. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, the main problem here is that PCPs are really expensive. So, like as as uh, as Ale said, um, you know they've gone down from being sort of galactic algorithms that you can't run but are technically polynomial time to uh, being prohibitively expensive. So, like tens of megabytes for for the resulting stock. Uh, so, what do we do? And uh, Ale already gave a, gave us a hint in his talk. We're going to try and build snarks from from IOPs instead. Um, why? Because known IOPs are more efficient than known PCPs. Um, and the idea is quite straightforward, right? So uh, what you do is you, uh, so what you do is you, you take this, uh, this Killian for PCPs protocol that we applied for HMA to, and you sort of generalize it to a Killian for IOPs protocol. So you just, uh, you know, you, you do the, the same protocol, like this Killian protocol, but you do it for many rounds, like as many rounds as you have uh, Oracle strings. Um, and then you apply for HMA to make it into an interactive protocol. So you don't, did, you don't end up having to pay really for this interaction. Um, so let's uh, take a look at sort of what that actually looks like. Um, so now we have uh, an IOP prover instead of a PCP prover, uh, and the IOP prover is going to generate the first uh, Oracle message in the IOP. It will then hash it, um, pass it into the random Oracle to generate the, the random, like first verifier message, the first verifier randomness in the IOP. You feed that into the IOP prover, and then he spits out uh, another uh, Oracle message for the IOP, um, which you then plug into the uh, to the random oracle, and you can do this for as many rounds as you have in the IOP. Eventually, uh, after this, the end of this chain, um, and I should say that the, the previous hash gets plugged into the to the oracle as well, in order to uh, uh, in order to uh, make sure that these hashes are like in a chain. You can't do anything anything strange by reordering the rounds. Um, at the end of this chain, you you. Uh, plug this the the resulting hash value into the uh, query algorithm. This is the verifies kind of query randomness, um, and then you do exactly the same thing as in 
uh, PCP, you, you like look at all the queries that the verifier is going to make, and you open um, each of the strings at the appropriate query position. So the, there are now multiple routes, and relative to each route, you have different authentication paths for the different queries. Um, so uh, the verifier is then uh, sort of analogous to the uh, PCP verifier. Um, the difference here is that you know now you need to check this entire chain of hashes. So you need to check that like the hash of the first root is uh, you know, if you hash the first root and then you hash the second root with that hash and so on and so forth, then you get the correct um, like uh, the, then then you get the correct randomnesses that, that were derived by the prover. Um, and you plug this into the decision algorithm along with the the answers that the prover gave you. Um, and uh, and output the, the uh, and accept if, if the uh, IOP verifier accepts. So really, this is like a, like conceptually very similar to the protocol from PCPs. Um, and what you get out really is the same thing. Like it's a, it's still a um, an interactive. Sorry, it's still a, a, a snark. Um, so you sort of you you got all of this interaction. Um, uh, so you like introduce all of this interaction in order to try and make things more efficient, and then you got rid of it all by by like using the random oracle to derive the randomness by using HMF. Okay, um, so uh, so you know it was proved proven in 2016 that this construction works, um, and so you get a, a snog that is secure in the random oracle model. The snog costs are basically the same as before. So if you like the IOP parameter, IOP parameters are similar to PCP parameters, except that you just sum over all of the rounds, um, and the proving time is uh, is going to be uh, the same as the IOP proving time plus some small overhead. The same for the verification time, and the argument size is still small. Um, so there we go. Uh, and so in, in the end, what you get is that that uh, you can sort of replace PCPs with IOPs in the random oracle model, and you will still get snogs. Um, you also, uh, this transformation preserves zero knowledge and proof of knowledge, so all of these technical properties still hold. Uh, you can you end up with the ZK snog. Right. Um, so uh, what I didn't touch on in the last slide, which I had talked about before, is soundness. And the reason is that soundness is actually somewhat complicated in these in these multi round protocols. Um, so the quantity that is important here is what's called state restoration soundness, um, which is something that's quite different to interactive soundness in many settings. Um, and uh, this is actually sort of a statement that applies also to like any fiat shamir of, of any protocol. So not not just you know the most general case of IOPs, but but like all, all uh, interactive protocols, you have to worry about this. Um, and state restoration soundness is, is the following thing. So, uh, so if I have an interactive protocol between a prover and a verifier, um, then in the interactive setting, you know, I have to run through sort of a, an interaction in order, right? So I, I do like uh, I send a message, and the verifier sends me randomness. Uh, I send a message, the verifier sends me randomness, and so on. And like when I get to the end, if the verifier rejects, then I'm done, right? As the prover, I, I have lost. Um, in non-interactive settings, uh, I can, like, so long as I am able to, to simulate the verifier in my head, then uh, I can suddenly try and, like, produce another transcript, right? So I can just sort of run through the protocol again and, uh, and like, re-simulate the verifier. And if I happen to find an accepting transcript, right, then, then I'm, I'm good. Um, but state restoration soundness is, is more than that. Um, so what you can also do is you can take, say, the first uh, transcript that you ran, and you can pick some prefix of it, like this M1R1, and then you can resample the suffix. So you can put in a different message and get a new randomness, a new uniform randomness. Um, and let's say that you, you know that one doesn't accept either. Um, you can also you, you know go, go to some other transcript um, and pick a, like pick another transcript and uh, or, uh, and use that prefix instead. So like maybe I choose the second transcript. And then I get uh, like a, a, another related transcript where the, the prefix is the same and the, the suffix is different. So I can play this kind of uh, this kind of weird game where I'm trying to where I'm basically able to explore the tree of transcripts in this way. 
Um, and all I have to do as the prover is to find any accepting transcript in in this sort of like via this method. Um, and uh, uh, this can actually give you like quite different behavior to standard interactive soundness. So it's related to the standard soundness by basically a factor of t to the k, where t is the number of random oracle queries or the number of times that you can uh, sort of do this, uh, this, this like resampling of the transcript. Um, and this is actually tight for some protocols. So, um, you know, that you can, you can write down protocols where uh, this, uh, where this, this sort of inequality actually is actually tight and, and equality. And this, this is really bad because if K is somewhat large, like, uh, even sort of logarithmic, um, then T to the K is going to be really huge. Um, and it's actually going to be a significant security loss. Um, thankfully most widely used protocols have good state restoration soundness. So things like, you know, fry and, and. Uh, bulletproofs and all kinds of like uh, your favorite log round protocol, some check, like all of these actually have good state restoration soundness and they don't succumb to this. But it is still important to to consider this whenever you're designing protocols. Um, one like important example that came up recently is actually the parallel repetition of a Sigma protocol um, is uh, like like uh, a K round Sigma protocol, I guess, like uh, does not have good state, restor state restoration soundness, which is sort of surprising. Um, so it's important to think about this, um, but it, you don't have to sort of worry about it for existing protocols because uh, because essentially all protocols that we use in practice uh, have good state restoration soundness. Okay. Um, so uh, what does that to say about IOP-based snugs? Well, basically the the you know the the as before, random oracles don't exist. It's a shame. Um, all of the good stuff stays the same. So we haven't really lost anything uh, in terms of the, the sort of nice properties of uh, PCP-based knobs. Um, but we no longer have this issue that PCPs are expensive. Um, we can uh, we can sort of move from PCPs to IOPs, which are, which are much more efficient. Um, OK, uh, so. I'm gonna sort of uh, go through a little bit the, the, the sort of history of IOP-based snogs, uh, which is not very long. Um, basically, the the way that this has gone is uh, the we've been sort of pushing to improve the asymptotics of IOP protocols, um, and this inspires ways to sort of improve the concrete parameters of IOP protocols, which you know is sort of a self-reinforcing cycle. Like it's it's like exploring the space of IOPs. Um, and as a result of this uh, of this research effort, you end up with improved IOP-based snobs. Um, so uh, there are a few uh, sort of families of constructions that, that exist. Um, the original one is, uh, is this uh, secure computational integrity thing, uh, succinct computational integrity, SCI. Um, which uh, which was based on sort of PCPs. I mean, it, it's like a, it's it's almost a PCP. It's kind of a PCP where you uh, like break it up into two rounds, but basically a PCP. Um, and this gave, gave you something which was like uh, you know a few tens of megabytes, uh, which is maybe a little bit better than than you can do with a, a plain PCP. Um, and there was this Lihero, uh result, which is sort of uh, the, the first kind of um, like is a is a good concrete improvement. Uh, it's a it's a square root sized sized argument where basically you um, like arrange your your witness into a matrix, and then you and then you do this kind of folding of a of interleaved Reed Solomon codes, um, and this gets you down to you know a, a few megabytes. Um, then more recently, there's sort of a couple of different uh, types of construction that get you to 100 kilobytes. Uh, so there are these the uh, stocks of Starkware, um, which are uh, based on these uh, these IOPPs for um, Reed Solomon with uh, linear size and logarithmic query complexity, and this uh, is sort of a snark for for machines. Um, and then uh, sort of following on following on from that. Uh, at roughly the same time, there was uh, the, uh, this, the Aurora protocol, which is uh, based on a um, univariate version of the Suntrick protocol. 
Uh, this one is for, for circuits or R1CS. Um, and so this is sort of where we are as of 2018, and we haven't really gotten much further than this. Uh, and so there's a natural question of like, can we do better? Can we like go to 10 kilobytes or one kilobyte or less than a kilobyte? Um, so, uh, um, one second. Um, okay. So, so this is sort of a, a natural question, like, uh, you know, where, where, like, where do we go from here? Um, and there are some sort of, uh, like, th there are some sort of asymptotic uh, limitations, which, which, uh, which sort of put barriers on how far we can go. Um, so uh, if you like restrict to looking at uh, protocols based on on sort of PCPs and IOPs that are compiled using Macaulay or BCS. Um, then you can look at kind of the asymptotic parameters and the sort of best practical parameters, like the best things you would actually want to run on a computer, um, have the, the, these asymptotics, basically linear proof length, um, like linear alphabet size and roughly kappa times log n. So kappa is the security parameter here, kappa times log n queries. Um, and if you compute the argument size, you get this kappa squared log squared n, um, which you know you can think of as being bounded by kappa to the fourth power. Um, uh, if you are willing to sort of uh, go to the realm of like good asymptotics, but like kind of um, impractical uh, as an implementation, um, then you can do a little bit better. So you can shave off a log n um, by basically you're using a different low degree test. Uh, and then there is a question of uh, so that this the, the, these two are sort of the what we know so far. Um, and then there is an open question. Uh, so can you uh, basically go from kappa queries to kappa over log n queries? Um, and this is called the sliding scale conjecture. Uh, and it's it is open. It would get you down to an argument size of, of like something like kappa squared. Um, so if you got there, then you would be able to hopefully get arguments of size sort of less than a kilobyte, um, which is, uh, which is pretty great. Um, the, and, and actually this is sort of the best that you can hope for. Uh, so you can show that if you can go below this, uh, sort of kappa over log n queries, then you would break some like, uh, uh sort of very reasonable complexity theoretic conjecture. So uh, this is sort of the best that we believe that you can do. Uh, in particular, the argument size needs to be basically kappa squared. Um, it turns out that actually, if you move away from Macaulay and you you sort of uh, you know optimize things a lot, then you can do a little bit better than kappa squared. Uh, but it's it's sort of a parameterized thing, it's a bit subtle. Um, basically, this this kappa squared is kind of the the limit. Um, Still, I mean, it's still sort of out of reach, and it would be great if we could if we could get there using efficient constructions. Um, but uh, but there is sort of an asymptoting limit that you hit. Uh, okay. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to talk about um, is post quantum security. So uh, I think I, I have a few minutes left. So. Um, Post quantum security is, you know, something that's very important these days. Uh, a lot of people are thinking about it. You know, people are building quantum computers. Um, even President Trump was interested in quantum computers. Um, and NIST has been uh, thinking about post quantum cryptography for a very long time. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, there's already been uh, like standardization competitions, and this is still still ongoing. They're evaluating uh, you know, signature schemes and things like that. Um, so you know, the post quantum security is a big deal. Um, and uh, if you don't believe NIST about this, uh, then uh, you can also take a look at this uh, uh, screenshot from from the show, uh, a Netflix show, Altered Carbon, which is set in the year twenty one forty one. Um, and you can see that uh, people are buying things uh, in Bitcoin and, and Zcash. Um, and if they are going to be using Zcash, then you would hope uh, that 
you know, the, the, we would we would have made it post quantum by that. Um, probably in the year 20, 2141, there will be quantum computers. Um, so uh, the problem that we have is that all sort of discrete logarithm based constructions are insecure against quantum adversaries. And this includes sort of most, you know, things like Grohl 16 and, and basically everything that Produce will be talking about. Um, and so uh, this sort of means that they have kind of a, a an expiration date, right? Like at some point, um, quantum computers will exist and they will be, you know, good enough to break cryptography and then you know, all of our snarks will be insecure. Um, thankfully, everything presented in this talk is post-quantum secure. Um, and I want to sort of elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so back in uh, 2018, uh, a very similar talk to this was given. Uh, where there was this caveat that that sort of everything is like plausibly post quantum, so we don't know of any attack, right? In the case of di discrete log schemes, like Shor's algorithm gives you an attack. Here we only have hash functions, so we didn't know of any attacks. Um, since then, uh, we've actually come a long way in terms of the provable security, uh, so we can prove that all of these schemes, uh, that many of these schemes are, the, are post quantum. Uh, so I'll give you just a couple of results. So firstly, this um, BCS transformation from IOP to SNARKs and also the Macaulay transformation. Both of these are secure in what's called the, the quantum random oracle model, which is the natural quantum analog of the random oracle model. In particular, it models uh, superposition access to a, to a hash function, which a quantum computer would have. Um, the caveat here is that we only know how to show uh, soundness from, from a sort of stronger property of the IOP called round by round soundness um, versus uh, state restoration soundness in the classical setting. But thankfully, again, most protocols satisfy round by round soundness, so everything's fine. Um, the uh, a more recent result is that the interactive protocol is the, that I presented at the beginning, this uh, Killian interactive protocol, uh, is also post-quantum secure, assuming uh, the quantum hunters of learning with errors. So this is like in the plain non-random oracle model. Uh, this is really hard to show. Um, so uh, the problem here is that uh, the classical proof is by rewinding. So you sort of take, an, uh, take your adversary and you like run him on many different choices of challenge. This is how you prove many interactive protocols are secure. And in the quantum setting, uh, rewinding doesn't work basically because of uh, the no cloning theorem, because of the non-clonability of, of quantum states. Um, and so what do you do? Well, it, it turns out there's a, um, there's like a, you know, you, you can do a lot of work and eventually you, you can, uh, you can extend the rewinding, the, this, uh, rewinding technique to the quantum setting. Um, there is still a lot of open stuff. Um, so like, you know, I, the, I, I, we haven't, for example, shown IOPs for Killian is secure in the quantum setting. Uh, sorry, Killian for IOP is secure in the quantum setting. Uh, we don't know how to prove security of Killian from CRHF, so only QLWE. Uh, we don't know, uh, so the, there are these like lattice bulletproof protocols that sort of uh, like, it's like bulletproofs are based on lattices and these could be post quantum, but we don't know. Like there's a lot of stuff that is still open. Uh, so, you know, even though we've come a long way, there is a lot of progress to still be made. And I, I'm currently working on this and I would love to talk to people if they're interested in that. Um, so just to conclude, um, so hash-based hash -based snarks are sort of something that's really well mapped out. Um, we have a bunch of constructions, uh, you know, from PCPs and from IOPs, uh, and there's also there's this, this sort of more exotic construction. Um, we understand their security very well, so we have, you know, good security in the in the random oracle model and the quantum random oracle model that's sort of very, like, precisely understood. Um, and robust in the sense that you know, even if my hash function is broken tomorrow, I can just pick a new one, and then and then I'm I'm you know uh, ready to go again. Um, on the other hand, we have some sort of we we understand the, the 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 structure of these things, so we understand actually how to go from a snog back to an IOP. We know how to build a snog uh, a snog from an IOP, and then we know how to build an IOP from a snog. So really, we, we, we have like a good characterization of, of how these things work, which actually leads us to lower bounds, which are pretty close to being tight. 
Um, uh, so, you know, this, this is great. Like we sort of, we understand everything um, in this setting really well, but it also means that kind of we're a bit stuck. Like we, we have these lower bounds, we, we have these barriers and like, it seems like there's not really much further we can go. Um, so in the next talk, Pratusha is going to be talking about um, sort of searching for treasure in uncharted waters. He's going to be talking about leaving uh, the sort of cozy world of hash-based snarks that we understand using more cryptography to uh, obtain proof systems that maybe where the, where the security is a little bit less well understood, but the efficiency and other properties can be a lot better. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, thank you so much, Nick, for the talk. Um, yeah.